To serve in the Peace Corps. To serve in all parts of the world. To serve with little pay. To do jobs that uh, most of them have never done before. They, I think, are serving this country well. And in a very real sense, they are serving a larger cause. The cause of freedom and the cause of a peaceful world. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the My Peace Corps Story podcast. I'm your host, Tyler Lloyd, and I'm here to help tell the stories of current and return Peace Corps volunteers. If you like what you hear today, be sure to let me know over at MyPeaceCorpsStory.com and connect with me on Instagram at MyPeaceCorpsStory or on Facebook at MyPeaceCorpsStory. Additionally, head on over to iTunes and leave a review for the show. Five-star reviews are extremely appreciated, but more than anything, I want to know what I can do to make a better show for my audience. Today, I am very pleased to welcome Joan Barker to the show. Joan served in Niger from 2005 to 2007 as a community health volunteer. Today, she shares some of her many and varied stories with us. I think you guys will really enjoy them, especially the one about being bitten by a rabbit dog. Well, without further delay, here's the show. This is this is this is this is my my Peace Corps Peace Corps my Peace Corps my Peace Corps story story story. My name is Joan Barker, and this is my Peace Corps story. Hello, Joan. Uh, welcome to the My Peace Corps Story podcast. I'm extremely excited to talk to you today. Uh, so, everybody, uh, here's Joan. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Likewise, a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah. Start off by just telling everybody uh, a little bit about yourself. What do you want people to know before we, we get into your unique story? Well, I guess a, a little background on myself as a volunteer. So I was a Peace Corps volunteer in year from 2005 to 2007. Mm -hmm. Um, and I lived the first year that I was there, I was in a pretty rural outpost and then did my second year in a more like a busier city. So I had kind of this dual Peace Corps experience. Um, yeah, but I was a health volunteer there and then that, and I was teaching, uh, casually teaching people English that wanted to learn English there. And that kind of inspired my post Peace Corps career, which has been teaching English as a second language. Okay. Very cool. So what drove you to join the Peace Corps? Well, I was, <laughs> like many Peace Corps volunteers, I graduated college and wasn't really sure what I was doing after college. Um, and I had always heard about the Peace Corps, but never really thought it was something that was like a tangible, like a thing that I could access. I just didn't know anybody that had done Peace Corps, and it wasn't really something a lot of people around me um, in I grew up in Connecticut, went to school in Rhode Island. I didn't really know a lot of people that did Peace Corps, but ran into a recruiter at a, uh, a job fair at the end of my senior year. And um, it was a recruiter. He was based out of Boston, the Peace Corps recruiter, a great guy. And he basically was like, you know, if, you, if you're nervous about this process, just start it. It's a long process. You can, you know, the application process, as you know. <laughs> it took about a year, and then I got in, and I was like, all right, I'm going to go do this. So um, I was really excited to to have that opportunity open up for me. Mm -hmm. And then did you have preconceived notions of what Peace Corps was going to be? Did you have any idea of what exactly you'd be doing? I, I had no idea. It was such a vague, um, and this is before, you know, social media or anything. So it wasn't like you could just go on people's Instagrams or Facebook and like look at their pictures and see. And I, again, like I said, I had not known anybody personally that had done the Peace Corps. I just kind of figured like, oh, they take you up in a helicopter and drop you off in the middle of nowhere and like have a fun two years. Um, and so I didn't really know what to expect. And basically it was just really open to the whole process. Like when they asked me, where do you want to go? Where, where would you know, they couldn't give you, you know, post you or you requested to go, but they basically were like, is there an area you would like to serve or things that you'd like to do? And I just said, I, I really, I have no idea off the top of my head. So like, wherever you want to send me, like, let's do this. And, um, and then I got the letter that was assigning me to Niger. And I have to admit, like, I was so ashamed at the time. Like, I had to pull out a map. I had no idea where Niger was, never heard of it, not, didn't know anything about the country. Um, but, you know, as I started to read more about it and then we um, got I think we got put in touch with some folks that had served there. You can get in touch with some like RPCVs, Return Peace Corps volunteers and emailing with them. Um, then I just kind of started to realize like, oh, yeah, this is what it's going to be like living in the bush, living off the grid. And um, yeah, but I, I really didn't know what to expect. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's funny that you say that about uh, getting your letter. Because when I got mine, I remember opening up thinking, um, is, is this a country? Yeah. 
I had no idea. And then it's funny when I when I talk to people now about you know oh I served in Burkina Faso they give you this blank stare and I'm like oh no don't don't worry I did, I didn't know it was a country either. Like, yeah, yeah yeah I know. Yeah. People are always like you mean Nigeria and I'm like no I'm pretty sure I mean you share because they've not they've not heard of it. But my mother yeah. wept like she was crying because she was like I have no this is in the middle of nowhere you're going to the middle of nowhere and I may never see you again. <laughs> but. Yeah, I'm glad that I, I had that experience. Learned a lot about West Africa. So before we uh, started talking today, I sent over just a few questions, uh, mm-hmm. pretty general and generic, just to get a sense of uh, your service and to, to orient me a little bit. And one of the things that I asked was, you know, uh, what is one of your favorite Peace Corps memories? Which I know as a return volunteer myself is such a hard question. It's sort of yeah. that generic question of people. I was like, oh, well, what did you like about the Peace Corps? It's like, well, how do you sum up two years of yeah. your life into like a, a thing, a soundbite? Um, yeah. But but one thing that you wrote back was uh, walking the route from your village uh, post, oh, yeah. uh, d- uh, to the paved road, which was four miles. Uh, so yeah. can you tell us a little bit uh, more about that and why is that such a favorite memory for you? Yeah, so um, I am a huge introvert and... <laughs> One of the challenges of being in the Peace Corps, as you know, is you're constantly surrounded by other people during your training. Um, And then when you're out at post, if you're put into a, whether it's a city or a town environment, um, there's always people in your face curious as to who you are and what what you're doing there. And there can be, I'm just used to having a lot of privacy. And so the only time that I felt that I could ever really be alone was when I was walking this long road that led into my village post and back out to the main road. And I just remember like the first couple months of being posted out there alone was just, it was so hard and it was so isolating and not, I never felt lonely because again, I'm surrounded by these villagers that are, you know, Mm -hmm. always wanting to have me over for tea and talk. And it wasn't, I wasn't lonely, but the challenging thing was just always having to be on. Um, and your brain is on trying to figure out the language and people are speaking to you and you're always kind of bracing for like the next social interaction. Am I going to get it right? Am I going to screw it up? Like you're just, I was just always like high anxiety that first month trying to get things right culture and language wise. And then I remember the first time I was, um, I was able to get out of the village because we had to, the first month that they post you, you have to stay out of post for a month. They really want you to, to stick it out and do that first month. And, um, I remember walking out of the village to get back to the main road to head into our regional capital for a Peace Corps meeting. And um, I was just so blissful, like being alone on this dirt path um, because there was nobody around between the village that I was posted in and the main road. There was absolutely nothing. It was just millet fields like these basically just looked like you're walking amongst like corn stalks and you could walk that whole hour and a half and not pass by anybody else. And it was I just felt so relieved when I got on that path to like walk that walk. And it was like an hour and a half. Um, you usually walk in it, no matter how you time it, you're going to be spending some time in the really hot sun. Um, but I just felt so at peace. Like it was so quiet. There's no sounds out there. There's nothing. And it was like hearing the wind blowing through the, the millet stalks. It was like being at the beach when you hear like the breeze blowing through the grass. And I just kind of like, it brought me back to like, just like being at the beach when I was young. And I was like, I feel so relaxed right now and nobody's around and I don't have any pressures on me. And, um, so I just, I, I, I didn't take that for granted. And I remember like from then on in, if I was walking back to the village or out of the village, it was always just something for me to look forward to. Like, I'm going to have this hour and a half where I can just kind of like transport out of here and like meditate and like be away from, um, like this, the pressures and like, it was, it was tough for me sometimes out there. And I, I mean, we'll probably get into that as well, but yeah, it, it just, it was kind of like a little escape for me and that's why I liked it. And I could reflect on things and just kind of be alone in my mind. So I really enjoyed that. I know that sounds terrible. It's like, it has nothing to do with other people. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't want to sound like I'm like, I hate other people. I don't want to be around them, but it was, it, that was just a good um, space for me to kind of be alone and process things. And I needed that to be able to like go back into the next round of, of being on all the time. <laughs> no, yeah, no, it's funny that you ended with that. Cause I was about to say, you know, Peace Corps, volu- as a Peace Corps volunteer, you're working 24 seven. It's sort of yeah. like life in a fishbowl, but you know, you're always a Peace Corps volunteer. It's not like a nine to five job where you go in, you clock in, you say, okay, I'm working now. And then now I'm yeah. going back to my personal life there's no separation between of, you know, being your job as a Peace Corps volunteer and just being, just being you. You're uh, so, absolutely right. 
So I, I do you know completely understand. You know that it's just nice to have that moment where you can disconnect and sort of be with your own thoughts and not really have to always be like second guessing yourself and trying to figure out like, am I doing the right thing? Am I putting my foot in my mouth? Like, exactly. how is this going to work out? It's just like no, yep. like I'm just I'm just walking down the road. Yep. And like, and it's, it's, I had so many amazing, like one-on-one experiences with people that, that I lived with in that village or like other Peace Corps volunteers. I have a lot of great memories, but that was something that was like this recurring thing that like, as soon as I saw that question, I was like, oh yeah, like that was my peace. That was my like calm there. And I had, I had I just had a lot of really good walks <laughs> alone. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, yeah. And I guess the you know the exact opposite of that, the other side of the coin. Uh, what's one of the least favorite Peace Corps memories uh, that that you have um, that like comes yeah. to mind? Well, so I know that I had written to you about this the time that I had gotten bitten by the dog. It's kind of mm-hmm. a longer story, but it was like this emblematic story of life in the village where I was posted. Um, I don't know that I have like one memory that sticks out, but. Um, like a recurring thing that was like really difficult for me was um, living in a place where I, I had a lot of, um, I don't want to say resistance. I don't know if that's the right word, but I had a tough time out in that, that original post down the village because it was a very remote, isolated place, um, pretty conservative uh, Muslim village. And it was really trying to go out there and do the work that Peace Corps had kind of assigned us to do. And we didn't have any specific job per se, like like you were saying, it's not like a nine to five thing where I had an office that I went to. Um, a lot of us rural health volunteers. I was part of the health education program. And our job was to go out and talk to people about sanitation and, and medicine and um, encouraging people to go travel to the cities to go to health clinics and get, for example, get their kids immunizations and stuff. Um, and I guess to keep a long story short, uh, I got a lot of pushback and I didn't get a lot of buy-in from the, the villagers and it was that was kind of tough and a lot of it was when you start understanding the relationships there between the culture and the gender and the religion and just thousands of years of this is the way things are done and then you got, you know, Peace Corps volunteers or other NGOs coming in and saying, hey, we think you should try this or do that. There's some things that people are going to be into and then there's a lot of things where they're going to be like, nope, no thanks, like, like family planning, for example, that was a big mm-hmm. thing we were supposed to be doing over there was encouraging family planning and, and birth control with the women. And it's like, that's the women don't make those decisions there. The men do. So, you know, like the men were not on board with that. Like, why would you um, like, why would you want to encourage somebody to have a quote unquote smaller family or a planned family when, you know, these people are living in a world where babies die all the time. And the more babies you have, the and in their view, you know, like the better chance you know, kids have a surviving. So you're just dealing with a lot and, uh, of, of trying to figure out, well, how do you guys say this in the right way or try to sell this in the right way where people are going to get on board with it. And a lot of that is learning to partner with local NGOs and Nigerians from the cities, um, local doctors and hospitals to get them to work with those rural outposts, because it's going to make the most sense coming from them. Like other people that are, um, fluent in the language or native and understand things from a religious point of view. So um, I guess, you know, the hardest thing for me was just, I kind of, I came away from Peace Corps feeling like I didn't get anything done. Um, a lot of people be like, what did you do when you were there? What did you build? Like what, you know, people have that mm-hmm. idea that you're going and you're, people are just going to accept you and everything you have to say because because you're, you're an American or you're side and you're like, quote unquote, rich. And you, so you know things. And it's like, no, like these people aren't, they're, they're not, they're intelligent people. And there's, they have reasons for doing things the way they, they do. And I just felt like in comparison to a lot of other volunteers in Niger, I, I don't want to say like I had it the hardest, but I definitely had a, was assigned to an area that was known for giving a lot of pushback on those areas. And I, I felt always like I'm a failure. I didn't get enough done. I couldn't get these people to get on board with, with these programs. And we, and eventually that was my reason for, for leaving that post and moving to the city was I think Peace Corps and I and the village elders kind of came to this understanding, like this isn't what they want. Like they wanted me to give them money. They wanted me to build them a mosque. They wanted a, like a clinic. They wanted like tangible things for me that we were not able to, to give to them. It was like, this isn't our program. This isn't what we're selling. We're supposed to be doing sanitation education and women's education and women's literacy and they were basically like well we don't want that <laughs> you know that, that was really really tough um and i and i had a really 
great experience in a lot of other aspects there, and I have a lot of friends that I made there and a lot of good memories, but I have a lot of, when I think about my time that, that first year, it was, it's really hard for me to even like talk about it or think about it because it was, it was hard. It was hard just day in, day out, trying to have conversations with people and have them being like, well, we don't, we don't want that. The, we don't want the women to have a literacy class. We don't want them to have a women's savings program. Like the men basically saying, we're going to put the kibosh on that. Like, no. And that, that's really hard to see and to watch. And, uh, yeah. So that, that mm-hmm. was, that was hard. Oh yeah. And for, for me, I think eventually what I realized what I because I struggle with a lot of similar things, and it was realizing that coming from America, that I was a I was a Type A personality. I was used to being in control and taking charge and just making things happen. And you know, I had these big ideals of what I was going to do and the change I was going to make in this community. And then you land there, and it's just yeah, that, that no, it doesn't work. Like you just butt yeah. heads. And it's yeah. sort of like your locus of control shifts and you're just mm-hmm. not in control. And I wasn't used to that at yeah. all. And it was very scary. So yeah. why, why are the things I'm trying to do not working? <laughs> yeah. And it's hard because there's – and what a great thing is that a lot of other – posts around me with volunteers like they did get a lot done where people were like really on board with seasonal gardening efforts or building like grain storage centers or building schools and things that they were able to do because there were certain people in those villages that were like really gung-ho and on board and had been working with NGOs prior so I just was like well I just felt like I was always getting kicked while I was down. It was just like, man, other people are doing it and I just can't get anything off the ground. But like, and like you said, it was like, well, it has to be me doing it. And it's like, I mean, I gave up on that real quick. Like I didn't have any e- sense of ego about it, but it was just like, yeah, I mean, I, like you said, it's it's like, you know, here in the U.S., you get in a car and you go to work and just going through those motions of being in control of your life and like checking off the boxes throughout the day. Like I got dressed mm-hmm. and I went to the office and people are like, wow, you're being productive. And there's no real like measure, like vector of success. Like in the morning there, it was like, you know, you get up. I had to go to the well to draw my water and then come back home. And it was like, what am I going to do every day to like show these people that I'm actually like doing something here. A lot of them in the beginning, especially the first six months, you know, Peace Corps had told us your job is just to sit there and like learn about people, learn the culture, learn the language, get a feel for who these people are and like what they might be, what, what they, what help they want. And, um, and so I was constantly surrounded by people who were just like outright explicitly asking me like, what are you doing here? Like, what's the point of you being here? When are you going to show us the money? And it's like, I, I'm like, I'm just trying to figure out, you know, what life is like here and like how we can live together and work together. But people wanted to see tangible things for me and, and things that I couldn't give them. And that was, that was always really, really hard. So. Mm-hmm. And then how did things change going from that rural environment to your second year when then you went to the city? Yeah, so I was really lucky. Um, you know, I, I talked to my Peace Corps supervisor that was actually we had a, um, a, a Nigerian guy named Suli who sadly just passed away this year. But um, he was our health um, sector manager and he was based in the capital. And, and I had been talking to him for a long time about, you know, I just don't think that things are going to fly here. I, I don't think that it's going to work out. And I, I, but I really don't want to go home. I don't want to quit and go back to the U S yet. And he worked with Peace Corps and another volunteer that was in my region. And, um, they figured out a way for me to go have a split, um, a house with this Peace Corps volunteer that was posted in a nearby city. So we became flatmates and, um, and then I, so I ended up working in collaboration with, um, with him and we worked with the local clinics and the local schools and the local government office because there had kind of already been this partnership with Peace Corps in those offices and Mm -hmm. the work that this other volunteer had already kind of gotten started in the city since he had been there for the same amount of time. He'd been there for a year. So I kind of piggybacked off him a little bit. We did some projects together, but it was also just a lot easier to be in a city environment where, um, I mean, in the cities, a lot of those, there's school systems that are in place. A lot of them had gone through like the quote unquote French educational system. They'd, you know, gone to school and learned French and just kind of, they'd been more exposed to like Western life and Western ideas. And so, and just, there's a lot of NGO presence in Niger as there is across a lot of in the Sahel, Sub-Sahara. So a lot of those folks that worked in the local government ministries had been used to partnering with um, you know, folks that were doing nonprofit work or, 
or whatnot. So yeah, I was just able to kind of tap into that infrastructure that was already there and, 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 and get a lot of, I guess, work done. Like it was easier to measure success in that environment. Like, yeah, we put together like a training and people showed up or we worked with the government on this or that educational campaign. So it was good. Like we got to, we got to actually do some work and, and that felt good. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, the the story with the dog being bit by the dog. Is that something you want to you want to tell people? Is that yeah? So I and mean, then that was a story when I when I told it to other volunteers. I think it got it. It was just kind. Of, it turns out to, it's just like a comedy of errors. So like it's a funny story that came out of like a really sour experience for me. Um, and when I tell it, I think it's just the story that I'm able to tell people. And it's like it. Sh- I kind of think it shows like all aspects of like what life in the village was for me. But um, yeah. So. And I and it's I was looking for this journal. <laughs> mm-hmm. I lost my Peace Corps journal time because I've been traveling a lot for for different jobs and I have a lot of stuff in storage. But I just dug the journal out this morning and was reading through this story and I was like, oh my god, it's even more bizarre than I remember. But um, <laughs> so I uh, had been at post for about five months and um, and I had I so another thing about Niger, which you probably learned in in burkina was uh dogs like street dogs there like every dog is a street dog and nobody Mm -hmm. really owns dogs as pets and also from a religious point of view it's not exactly halal to have a dog like living with you or or even be nice to dogs um and i i had a friend who a peace corps friend who knew that i wanted to kind of adopt a street dog and so she got me this puppy from her village that they were trying to exterminate some of the dogs from that village so, and a little aside, um, they would do these, like, campaigns where they would, like, round up dogs and, like, have to, like, kill them because they didn't have, like, any dog population control, you know? Like, we had, like dogs aren't getting spayed and neutered over there. Yeah. So, um, she took this little puppy that was, like, being rounded up by her villagers and uh, she brought it to, to me and was like, hey, I saved this dog for you. Like, do you want it? I was like, sure. But without any sort of hesitation, like, took on adopting this dog. Like, no, like, full well knowing, like, oh, God, this is going to be the people around me that I live with are not going to be on board with this. Like the people I live next door to in my village are like, why do you have this this little beast? <laughs> and like, what are you doing like with a dog in your house? That's so gross. Like, what are you doing? Um, so it was about a week after I got this dog, I would carry him around in my backpack and kind of zip him up so people couldn't see him when I was out and about because it just brought too much like unwanted attention. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I was walking across the village to go visit a friend of mine to have some tea and on the way to her house um i was approaching a like a group of people that were like hanging out under a a neem tree just drinking some tea and shooting the breeze and they were like waving to me and i was walking up to them to just say like a normal hello and i see their faces like looking at me like they're they're all smiling and all of a sudden like the smiles just dis their faces and all this look look of horror. I gotta look behind me because I'm like, they're looking at something behind me. And I, I couldn't even turn around. I just felt this like searing pain in the back of my leg. And before I knew it, like I just heard this like growling. I was like, oh, it's, it's a dog. And I, I turned on, there's this huge dog just like chewing out this piece of my leg. And I was like, oh, it's like what the hell is happening? And uh, so all of a sudden, like the, the guys that were drinking tea had, that had been sitting there in front of me, they get up and they start throwing stones at this dog. I finally let go of my leg and he runs away. And, and I realized like my little puppy had been like poking his head out of my backpack. So I don't know if that like got the attention of this big vicious dog, but anyways, he had bit me and I, it, it hurt like hell. And, um, but you know, as I'm like looking down at like my leg is like bleeding and these people are looking at me like, Oh my God, what just happened? And like, I start like crying, which is totally not Crying is, like, not a thing that you do in public over there. And it's, like, I don't know in Burkina if it was similar. But um, I'm sitting here, like, in this excruciating amount of pain. My leg is bleeding. I'm trying to fight back, like, tears because I'm so embarrassed that I'm crying in front of these people. And and they don't know what to do either. So I just start, like, limping, hobbling away back to my mud hut, which is probably about, like, a half mile away. And, um, like, with this trail of blood, my trying to keep my dog in my backpack, which is another added element of, like, people being like, what the hell is going on? Like, people are seeing me, like, hobble, like, bloody and, like, looking at me like, what? And she's got this dog hanging off her back. <laughs> like, it was just the weirdest thing. So um, I get back to my my house, my hut. And I'm like, well, what the hell do I do? I'm bleeding. Like, am I going to bleed out? Does, did this dog hit an artery? Like, there was a lot of blood. And I just was, like, freaking out. 
And, um, and people are coming up to me at this point. They've heard about like, oh, you know, Hadiza, which was my given name over there was Hadiza, which is the local, it's a Muslim name. And all of the Peace Corps volunteers are in Niger. Um, you take on a local name when you're there for cultural and safety reasons. So people can easily identify you. So people are coming up and they're like, Hadiza, Hadiza, we, we heard you got bit by the dog. Like what's going on? And, and my house, also at this point was like good but it wasn't like fluent and and I'm also like in this like traumatic moment so like I'm not thinking like in house I'm thinking in English like you know all these swears are coming out of my mouth being like I'm just like okay I have to figure out how to stop this bleeding Peace Corps had given us like a first aid kit so I'm like rummaging through my first aid kit like what can I put on this wound is it going to stop the bleeding oh no like I need to get out of the village I need to go to the regional capital and get some help but that's like a five hour like ordeal Mm -hmm. so like Am I am I gonna die out here? Am I gonna bleed to death? And like I I just I'm so I'm so panicked. And meanwhile, my neighbors are trying to talk to me in Hausa, and I can't like it's just it's just so hard like this broken communication. I was so I I just looked in my journal. I'd forgotten about this. I was crying because it hurt so bad and I was so scared. And so I just kept like my door closed and wasn't letting anybody in because I was so I was more embarrassed about the crying and how I was handling it than like anything else. Like I should have been thinking. I need to get myself to the local hospital. But all I was thinking was to do that. I have to go in front of all these people. And I'm crying. So I have to wait till I'm done crying, <laughs> which is so ridiculous. But, um, so eventually I get to the point where I've like cleaned up some of the blood and like, it seems like it's kind of slowing down and, and I'm trying to explain to people through the window of my house, like, which is just a screen. I was like, I'm going to go to Coney, which is Coney is the local city where we have a Peace Corps office. I'm trying to explain to these people, like, I need to leave. I need to go to Coney. And they're just telling me, oh, you can't go there. They're going to think something's, if you go and worry other people, like, don't make them worry about you. Like, we can take care of you here. And I'm thinking, like, there's nothing out here. Like, in our village, there's no clinic. There's no hospital. There's, like, a bush doctor. Like, are they going to take me to the bush doctor? So they, they're calling, like, the bush doctor. Like, you got to come look at this girl. And I'm like, no, no, no. Like, I've got to go get some, like, antibiotics. And they don't know what that means. So it's just all of this like culture like clashing at once, like trying to figure out the language, trying to explain to them in the way that's not going to hurt their feelings. Like, no thanks. Like the Bush doctor, he doesn't need to come here. Please don't call him. Like, I just need to like, you know, get myself to to the like the the American quote unquote American people doctor. <laughs> and so I don't know. Finally, they're like, all right, well, if you're going to leave, um, we have to send you out of the village with somebody that can help you like walk to the road. I was like, cool. And they're like, yeah, actually, better yet we'll get the chief to walk you out. Cause the chief lived like right next door. Like chief isn't busy right now. He's not out in his fields. Like he'll walk, he says he'll walk you out and he has a donkey. And I'm like, phew, like I'll be able to like ride a donkey out of town. Like, this is great. You know? Cause again, it's like a four and a half mile walk. And it, this is like high noon right now. It's like 110 degrees outside. So the chief comes over with the donkey and I'm getting ready to like get on this donkey. And then he hops up on the donkey and starts riding away. And he's like, all right, let's go. And, like, this is the point of the story where it turns from, like, horrible to, like, hilarious because I'm watching this guy, like, ride away from me on the donkey and it just hits me, like, he's he's the chief of the village. Like, there's no way he's going to walk behind a woman, number one, and behind his own donkey, number two. Like, he's on the donkey. Like, he's leading the charge. But here I am, like, with, a like, this bloody leg and this bloody skirt and I'm limping, again, with the dog in the backpack because I can't leave this dog out here. I, if I go to the, to the city, it's going to be, like, a two-week thing where I don't come back for a couple weeks because, you know, it's just it's a trek in, it's a trek out. You got to, you know, get your medications and whatever. So I'm like, I can't leave this dog. So here I am like limping with the dog out of my backpack again, like bloody leg, <laughs> just like tears streaming down my face, people like laughing. And here's this guy walking in front of me with a donkey. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. This is a ridiculous road show. But so we head out and we, uh, you know, we're, we, we got all the way out there. It was like a, uh, probably like an hour and a half, good hour and a half, two hour walk because we had to go so slowly because I couldn't really walk. Like my right leg was pretty much like out of commission. I was just like holding it. Like every step I took, I had to like grab my leg and kind of like pull it forward. But a few things like happened along the way that just like at least provided some comic relief, like walking behind this donkey at several points, like the donkey just when donkeys go to the bathroom, like when they take a shit, they don't stop. They just do it and they keep walking. So a couple of times, like, I got pooped on <laughs> and I'm like, I wouldn't have remembered that detail had I not put it in the journal. But like, I just remember like looking down at me like I, there's blood, there's poop and I, I'm just trying to like get through it. And then 
at one point when we're like, I could see the main road from where we were. It was probably still like a half mile out. Um, I go to take a step and my left foot, the good foot, the sandal popped. Like it, we were flip flops over there. You're walking around in flip flops, right? And this flip flop had just been like worn clean through and just like popped apart. And I was like, you've got to be effing kidding me. Like I'm covered in blood and shit. And now the sandal has like popped apart and I, will I have to walk barefoot for the rest of the way? So the chief hops off the donkey and with his machete in hand, like cuts off a piece of his fabric from like some rag that he had and like we fasten it takes us like a good 10 minutes we fasten away t- to get the flip-flop back together and so i keep like we hobble on and like we get to the road and now the challenge is um i have to wait for a car because on the road like a car might pass every like 20 or 30 minutes and you just basically have to sit there and hitchhike so which i was used to doing but just not in that condition so the the chief had to get back to the village because at this point he's worried about being able to make it back before sunset. So like he leaves me, like we greet each other goodbye and he like heads back off into like the fields. And I'm just sitting there on the side of the road with like a rag on my foot and my other leg is like bloody and like still covered in like donkey poop. And like my dog at this point is like whining. He has no idea what's going on. And I'm like, who's going to pick me up on the side of the road looking like this? Like normally it's hard enough to get a ride now I've got a dog and a lot of people won't pick you up if you have a dog or a cat or any animal like with you. And I'm like, what if I can't get a ride? What if I'm just stuck out on the side of the road with this bloody leg like all night? Like, is this how I die? Is this how they find my body? What are my parents going to think? You know, like those things just start going through your head and you're like, I'm out in the middle of nowhere and I'm helpless and I have no way to like remedy the situation. But um, I don't think I had to wait too long. A guy came by with his car and I think he just saw this like scared like teary eyed, like foreigner. And it was just a guy alone in his car, which was very unusual. Usually you see the bush taxis going back and forth. Um, but it was just this guy in like a really nice car. I think he was driving like a, you know, Mercedes Benz. And it's like, I don't know who this guy is, but somehow like in my broken house, I was able to communicate, like I've got hurt, like I got bit and I need to go to the city. And the guy gave me a ride and like, let me bring my dog in his car. And I was just like, cause I, at first I thought he's going to try to tie the dog on top. You know, cause a lot of people tie things on top of cars. He was like, no, you can bring your, your, your dog in the car. And and he didn't even charge me any money. Like when we got to the city, like he just felt so bad for me. I was in such a like state. Um, and then I had to go from that local city um, where we did have a Peace Corps like outpost, but they couldn't take care of me out there. So I had to then take a, uh, that night, I took an overnight bus ride, which was like seven or eight hours capital, um, where we had the Peace Corps medical officer and he was able to like take care of me and give me some rabies boosters and bleach out my wound. But um, yeah, like I won't get into all the details of that. I mean, that still, that was a whole nother like hilarious chain of events, like just getting to the capital city. But I think getting bit by the dog and then like just walking out of the village behind this dude on a donkey with like a bleeding leg was... It was just a lesson in culture and like letting go of (laughs) like American expectations. It's like, this is happening and you just kind of have to deal with it in the moment. And, um, and I I, I was terrified, but at least those like funny things that happened along the way out were like, I remember laughing. I remember just looking up at the sky and being like, I guess this is just like how this is going to shake down and I'm not going to die and it's going to be okay. And like, it might be humiliating, but I'm okay. (laughs) And, um, and I was able to like in the moment communicate my needs to people, which is huge when you're like in a foreign land or like nobody's speaking English and you're just like, I'm at the mercy of these people and what my language can allow me to do in that moment. Like what can, like being able to tell them, you know, like I need to go and you need to help me get to where I need to get to. And I, like, cause they did not want me to leave the village. They, I think you know, they, they felt like they're responsible for me and keeping me like alive and well. And if somebody finds out that I'd gotten bit by a dog, like, I think they feared some kind of like retribution. Like what is, is the Peace Corps just from the village? And then there goes like, there goes the honeypot, so to speak, or, you know, like, are they going to let me go get treated so that I can come back here and continue to live there? So that was like a weird, just a weird experience, but, um, there was some comedy in it. (laughs) Wow, <laughs> that is quite that is quite the story, and that's uh, leaving a lot. That's leaving a lot out too. Sorry, it took so long to tell it, but like, no, that's the, I, that's the watered down version. <laughs> it was it was highly enjoyable. Uh, I mean, every, everything that you know could have gone wrong, it it did. But you know, 
you, as you said, you know, you just sort of accept that, okay, this is what I'm dealing with at the moment and I'm just going to move forward or I'm going to have to die on the side of this road. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was quite an experience. So that's, that's, yeah. the, that's the dog bite story, but it's like that, that story's kind of like lived in infamy amongst the, uh, the group that I was there with. Like people know that story and it's like, yeah, well, if there's became... one thing I can take away. If there's one bit of bragging rights I have for this whole two years, I'll just, I guess that'll be it. Yeah, if you, not you much become else. the the girl. It's like, oh, did you hear about uh, Joan? Yeah, the girl that got bit by the dog. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Well, it got me, and, and you might know this too. Like to go to like the Capitol and get to be, I had to spend two weeks in the medical office, mm-hmm. getting cleaned up and like getting treated. But it's like I spent, I was in an air conditioned room in a bed, like a proper bed, and eating like cheeseburgers every day. Like Peace Corps paid for the lunch if you had to go to stay in the medical clinic. So I had like this little stipend to like. I was eating cheeseburgers and like sitting in air conditioning. So it was like, well, this worked out. I got like a two week vacation. So. Yeah, it's like, okay, this isn't the worst thing in the world. It's Yeah. You know. There's a silver lining. So, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much for sharing that story. Um, I mean, there's a few other questions that I asked you before, but I mean, after that story, I just, I don't even know if I want to ask anything else. <laughs> um, uh, I guess the one that, you know, what do you miss about Peace Corps? Um, is there, you know, one thing that, you know, day to day that, did you just really miss? Yeah, I, I think I, I mentioned it in that response that I wrote to you is like the, the camaraderie of the Peace Corps volunteers. Um, and that's not to say that I didn't have strong and enduring relationships with a lot of the local folks that we worked with. I have a lot of Nigerians that are, you know, friends that are in my phone and on my Facebook. And but I love those folks dearly. I think what I miss is just having the um, day-to-day like family of Peace Corps volunteers that, you know, like, when things are rough, like those people are going to be there to listen to you and also share their stories of what they're going through. And then there's times where we all get together and we can celebrate together and have things to look forward to, um, together. And I shared those two years with some people that I'm still really good friends with today. It's like 10 years out, just went to a wedding for a good friend of mine who the, the, with the second year of Peace Corps, um, you know, he just got married and I went out to his wedding and it was all Peace Corps volunteers like at the wedding. Like we haven't mm-hmm. seen each other in years, but it's like you see these people after 10 years and it feels like you just saw them 10 seconds ago. Um, I miss that family a lot. And uh, um, yeah, I, I, I miss like going through that whole experience with them from beginning to end. Um, but yeah, good people, good people that that um, that were over there doing some really good work. And I've continued to do like really, really amazing things after Peace Corps. So yeah. And then I guess we'll end with, um, I asked if you had a quote or a local saying that you would like to share with everybody. So do you want to say that in uh, Hausa? I'm assuming it's in Hausa, correct? Yeah. So the, the phrase is, Sanu, Sanu, Batahana Zua. And I know a lot of Peace Corps Niger folks would get a kick out of that one. I think that was one we were taught right off the bat. Sanu, Sanu, Batahana Zua. It translates to basically slowly slowly doesn't prevent you from getting there um which is the house of equivalent of of you know, the dogs that start barking in the background here all right sorry about that yeah yeah no problem I, uh, the dog sounds in the background were very fitting given you your, your story. <laughs> i know right exactly yeah. <laughs> a dog's attacking the male lady i'm just yep um <laughs> yeah so the meaning of the um of this the local, the local saying was uh, slowly slowly doesn't prevent you from getting there so it's like the uh, Hausa equivalent of um, slow and steady wins the race. And it's basically just like to have patience. Things are going to work out and you're going to get there in the end. Um, it was something that our Peace Corps trainers would tell us from the very beginning when we got into country, um, when we were learning the language, which was especially difficult. You know, sanu sanu batahana zua. Like, you're going to get there. Just take it slowly. Don't try to, especially for us type A personalities that are, you know, used to getting things done right away. It's just like you have to learn the art of patience and taking the long, slow road. Um, and yeah, so I, I've carried that with me post service, definitely. <laughs> it's a really great saying. Mm-hmm. No, it's a very fitting saying uh, for Peace Corps and one that's good to, you know, keep with you and sort of remind you day to day after Peace Corps. Yeah. Well, um, I think that that does it for uh, the interview today. I thank you again for you know coming on to, to share your story with everybody, and I think everybody will really enjoy sort of hearing your take on your Peace Corps experience. I know everybody's going to love the dog story, <laughs> uh, but yeah, once again, just uh, thank you so much for uh, for coming on uh, my Peace Corps story. Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. 
Thank you, everybody, for listening. Once again, if you want to stay better connected with me and the My Peace Corps Story podcast, head on over to MyPeaceCorpsStory.com. If you want to know my personal Peace Corps story, please check out my new book, Service Disrupted, available on Amazon. Every volunteer has a story. What's yours?